Father in heaven, I ask you to help me speak today so that everyone listening to this sermon may be encouraged to know and to believe that you, O oh Lord, that you will perfect that which concerns us, that you will complete us if we but submit our will to yours. I send this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading a new book. Well, it's new for me. It was written in 2013, Without Thomas Jefferson. You know, the writer of the Declaration of Independence. Do you know he was only 32 when he wrote that? 32 years old. Yeah. The book is authored by John Meekham, and it's called Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power. My wife and I, when last time we were up here a couple weeks ago, we're going through Barnes and Noble, and I don't really buy a lot of things. And if I go in the bookstore, I like looking, but I don't always buy. And yet I went to this aisle, and then it was kind of the political aisle, the history, the biography aisle, and I saw this book. I thought, I don't need that, but it was attracting me. And I think God was putting his spirit on me and says, get that book, you'll learn something. And lo and behold, it became an illustration from a sermon. You know, Thomas Jefferson's upbringing was such... This is important. Young people especially listen to this, because Thomas Jefferson was 20, 21 years old when he started on this path. He became a lawyer by the time he was 24. And the seeds of revolution were already there, 1765. It was 11 years later, he's 32 years old. Imagine the struggle in America at that time when we were not a nation. And you have the Virginia House of Burgesses meeting against British royal law because they had closed them down because they knew they were going towards revolution. <clears throat> Imagine the fear of people. Imagine also what was going on. We talked about it a little today with the issue of slavery. Imagine how Africans in America who were brought here as slaves felt when the British were saying things to them like, you know, we're going to be your friend if you fight for us against those Americans. Now, <clears throat> Lincoln writes this about Thomas Jefferson. Now, let me say it first about Ellen White. You know, Ellen White's been very judged by our modern times. A woman, a prophet, who wrote in a time period when there were no computers, no fast internet searches, in fact, the only concordances they had were called crudens. They were very crude by our means today, not even as good as Strong's. And our early people, Seventh-day Adventists, before they were even Seventh-day Adventists, start, studied the Bible out, burning the kerosene light towards midnight and beyond, searching with a crude concordance, searching in ways that we are blessed today to find answers like that, aren't we? And so Ellen White has been accused of plagiarism and things like that as well. But she's being accused from the modern day's perspective. And the definitions of plagiarism certainly have changed. If you wrote in those days and didn't give credit for it, especially if you're paraphrasing, that was no big deal. I say that because Meekham writes the same thing about Thomas Jefferson. Yes, he was a slave owner. But did you know that in 1769 he first pro proposed an emancipation for the slaves. Not a full emancipation like came later when Abraham Lincoln wrote, I believe in 1863. No, not like that, but it was an emancipation. Yet he still owned slaves even after the fact. Meekham writes that Jefferson had this type of mentality. He did not like conflict. Anybody else can identify with that? I bet not half of them at least. But here he's a politician, and he has to affect great change. And Thomas Jefferson, the Jeffersonian vision we still know today, politicians look toward that and try to imitate it. Jefferson was a great leader in spite of his faults. You know, to judge Jefferson by our day-to-day -day because he was a slave owner, and that, or for the way he thought of slavery, which today we would think that's a bad thing, to think that way. And his prejudices, Lula mentioned it in Sabbath school, Thomas Jefferson definitely thought that black people were a little bit lower than white people, mentally and intelligently. Yeah, he thought that. 
Well, that's why, you know, early America, how did they define boats? Remember the, how they defined boats? If you were a plantation owner and you owned slaves, you got an extra three-fifths of a boat if you owned a slave for every slave. Because I remember my eighth grade history teacher telling us this when I was eighth grade, kids. Bald-headed white man. I can say that because, you know, I was in his classroom. That's what I thought. And I remember him saying uh, <clears throat> these things about, if Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are <clears throat> created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, least of which is life liberty and the pursuit of what? Happiness. You know, I used to say property. Because in those days, only property owners could vote. It wasn't just race that kept you from voting. It wasn't just being a male or female. It was property. But the pursuit of happiness, which I would translate today to freedom, <coughs> the right to be free. And I asked my history teacher, well, how come they, they didn't connect the dot? They're writing this in the Declaration. They're all signing it. And yet, here they have a race of people that they are enslaving and saying, no, you're only three-fifths of a human being. And I still remember my history teacher saying, well, how could they do that? He said, well, they, they didn't think of the black as human. They thought of him as an animal. And that's where they got with the three-fifths of human. Interesting. Horrible, but interesting. Because, you know, that dynamic still affects us today. No matter who you are or where you were born. It still affects us today. Thomas Jefferson's upbringing was such that people like him, and now I'm talking about the elite class now, and not all whites were the elite class, there was few, but the elite class of whites in Virginia, especially at that time, they were raised to believe that they were destined to lead. What if you were raised to believe that you were destined to lead? Think about the way you raise your children, or the way you've been raised. They were raised to believe they were destined to lead. Jefferson believed he was destined to lead. And thus, a man like Jefferson, always being encouraged, was able to effect great change in this country in spite of this falls. This nation has become the greatest nation on earth because of how God moved through people like Jefferson. And no, Jefferson was not Christian. Well, he was raised that way. But you know, when he was young, he prayed a prayer in school. Listen to this, kids. He prayed a prayer in school that the day would end early. The school day would end early. You know, it didn't. And because of that prayer, when he was about 12 years old, he decided he had no use for orthodox religion. How could this happen? Because in this day, kids, I ask you if you know who you are, and, and, and schools today are going to tell you, and, and, and society is going to tell you, you're not who God says you are. And in those days is when the seeds of this started. This is the period of what we call the Enlightenment, the days of reason. And reason has begun in those days to triumph over religion and in the 19th century about a hundred years later it did through Darwinism and it's still here today reason over religion I have nothing against reason I think some of the evidence are some of the most reasonable and reason thinking people in the world we have an intellect par excellence from the Lord and we can stand with anybody on any topic in this world I believe because of our background because of our worldview. And our worldview is called the Great Controversy. Understanding what went on in the Great Controversy creates our worldview and helps us to interpret everything around us. Yes, children and young people in school, this is important for you because when you go to school, you just think everything's normal and everyone's just getting along and just want to be part of the crowd. Not normal for us human beings, not just you, but adults too. But you have to step back and say, well, wait a minute, what does God say? How should I really interpret what's going on around me? Should I go to those dances? Should I wear all that jewelry? Should I dress like them? Should I talk like them? Should I sing their songs? Should I repeat those songs? And all the older people in this room all went through that too in their day. And we still go through it today. We have to know who we are. 
I'm thinking about Jefferson being destined to lead. I'm thinking about this. What if? What if God's people had such a belief in their reason for being? <clears throat> what if they were united in their belief they could carry out God's work on this earth to effect such a great change in the hearts and minds of people? What if? And yes, I believe God raised up Ben Carson to get that question asked again because we're not well thought of. We're a minority in this nation. There's less than a million of us on the books, or a little bit more than a million. And I believe next year when the movie about Desmond Doss comes out, produced by Mel Gibson of all people, I believe God's going to do it again. God has given us an opportunity to talk about it in Sabbath school to stand and to speak. He's creating an opportunity. You know, someone came into my church, my other church at Camden, and in Brunswick too, because of Ben Carson. It was a Caucasian individual, not that that matters. Just letting you know. And they came to prayer meeting, and they came to church to hear me speak. Because of Ben Carson, they wanted to know about Seventh-day Adventists because of Ben Carson. We have an opportunity. And there's a whole political mess out there right now. No, I don't know who to vote for. I'm not here to talk about that. God will help you sort it out. But what if God's people could do what people like Jefferson did? Do you know, out of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, or there are about 52 of them, so more or less, do you know that all of them were deists, except for two? Do you know what a deist is? My father was a deist. Now, he wouldn't have known that word. Do you know what a deist is? How about a theist? Theology? Theos is the Greek word for God. So a theist is one who believes in God. But a deist believes in a different kind of God. A deist believes in the watchmaker God. Yes, they believe there's a God out there. This was what I was taught in school children in sixth grade by my public school teacher. The God... Created this world, yeah, some back in time. The Bible's not real accurate on it. We don't know how it was done. Yeah, there's a God out there somewhere, but he doesn't care. He doesn't give a, give a rip about what goes on in this world. He doesn't care. He's left us to ourselves. It's up to us to do what we can do to make this world better. And a lot of people live that way. And they're generally good people. <laughs> Remember somebody with the last name of Noah? Who am I speaking about? Say it louder, please. William. William Miller. William Miller was a deist because that was the Enlightenment era of the times. And most people today that believe in God really are deists. They believe in this, yeah, there's a God out there, but we don't know who he is. Or they might say who she is. Jefferson was a deist too, especially after he prayed that prayer in school and the school didn't end early and he just gave up organized religion. Now, in principle, they all acted like Christians. So yes, this nation, I believe, is founded on Christian principles. And I believe God moved on those men, even though they didn't believe in him as Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. They kept his commandments because that was a good thing to do, not because they believed it came from God the way God says it came from God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's Christian in principle. God moved on people that weren't strong believers in him, but they believe in good. They believe in doing better, and they believe this nation needed to be free. They didn't believe in intolerance. Though, you see the hypocrisy because they had their slaves, didn't they? When Jefferson introduced in the House of Burgesses in Virginia in 19, 1769 permission for the emancipation of the slaves. It was voted down. And because Jefferson did not like conflict, that was it. <clears throat> he didn't bring it up again. Not like William Wilberforce in England who fought again and again and again for it because he believed in it. Because Jefferson did not like conflict. So he worked through the art of compromise, but he was able to effect great change the same. And in 1776, on June 28th, when Jefferson first introduced the first draft to the Declaration of Independence, do you know there was a clause in there that he wrote? 
with his own hand. <clears throat> Let me read what he wrote. Because it was struck out and was voted down. You see, he was edited there on the floor of the Pennsylvania State House. This is what he wrote. Reprobating the enslaving, that means getting rid of, reprobating the enslaving of the inhabitants of Africa was struck out in complacence to South Carolina and to Georgia. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Who had never attempted to restrain the importation of slaves and who, on the contrary, still wished to continue it. Our northern brethren also, I believe, felt a little tender under those censors, for though their people have very few slaves, they themselves have been pretty considerable carriers of them to others. You can find that on page 105, 106 of Meekin's book if you're wanting to look. Now I know this is Black History Month, and being a former public school teacher from Los Angeles, I am very familiar with lessons in science, and mathematics, because that's what I taught, lessons that highlight the achievement of African Americans. Achievements that used to go unnoticed and unmentioned in the history books and in any of the textbooks. Yes, there is a purpose to having a Black History Month still. And I don't mean to rub anybody wrong, but listen to me, please. There's a purpose. If the purpose is only to remember the mistakes of the past that excluded the achievement of people of color, what if we just forgot we had a civil war and why it was fought? Can't we all just get along, as the saying goes? What if we just forgot? We should never forget. However, I believe God has an even greater reason for this country having a Black History Month. And that is that it gives us, his people, a good opportunity to share the gospel of what God has done for all his people. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, European, African, American, rich or poor, free or slave. Speaking of freedom, you know, a true Christian, even if the true Christian was a slave, should be free. Isn't that true? Isn't that the way we understand the gospel? Isn't that true? And if someone was rich, and like Bill Gates, should still be free. But sometimes people are like that are slaves to their own vices, aren't they? God speaks about true freedom, because he knows down here on this earth things are not fair. And slavery still goes on today, by the way, even in this country. Young women are imported as sex slaves in this country. Imported. It's hidden. It's all hidden. And there's other kinds of slavery all throughout the country. It's a horrible thing. But I believe, I believe that God works in marvelous and wonderful ways through the worst of circumstances. What kind of circumstances? What kind of circumstances? Worst. The worst. And I believe he uses the worst of circumstances to work through to make something good happen for his people and to glorify his name. Jesus went to the cross. That's the worst of circumstances. Yeah. Oh, we'd all like to have it good all the time. But you know, without a cross, we tend to get a little too happy. You know what I mean? And we just tend not to see the pain and suffering around us if we're just like that. It's when we go through the pain and suffering ourselves. That's why God allows his people to go through suffering. Because we need to experience what Jesus experienced. And we need to be able to live in a way that we will look to God for help. Amen. Amen. They don't church. It's called rich in need of nothing. Isn't that correct? There's a reason for that. Because, you know, America's gotten so prosperous. The world's gotten so prosperous. Adventists generally are prosperous. It's easy to be like that. But God will bring in a cross to each one of us and to us as a church so that we can be right with him because he wants us all in heaven with him. So expect it. Prepare for it every day by the daily things you do, by the daily ways you react and think. 
It's to God's glory in the worst of circumstances to bring something good. And I believe God is educating us, helping us to develop in character to be like Jesus. And he's doing that for his glory. The title of today's sermon is The Work of His Hands. Psalm 138. If you were here two weeks ago, I preached on the first three verses. Today, verses 4 to 8. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. But the proud, he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Amen. If you read the first three verses, or heard my sermon two weeks ago, then you should know that you should praise God for his loving kindness and his truth. You should praise God because he has magnified his word, where? Above all his name. <clears throat> you should praise God because when you cry out to him in prayer, When you cry out to him in your great need, he will make you bold. He will answer your prayer to make you bold and give you strength in your soul. Today, as we look at the rest of Psalm 38, I want to ask you a question. And thanks to B, your husband being ill and you having to leave, they know the question now because I got to tell the children's story. Do you know the question I'm going to ask you? Same question to ask the children. Say it, please. Ask it. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? If you are walking with Jesus in his mercy and his truth, and I challenge anybody to read the Bible, I believe in present truth. I am a Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. You can't shake me out of this church. Amen. God led me to the seminary for a reason that I would learn his word better. And as I was searching for truth, searching for truth, because it's truth that brought me into this church. It's truth that convinced me. I found out the Bible is true. I found out it could be understood. And it made sense scientifically and logically. But God also talked to me about his mercy. So I challenge anybody, when you start looking up that word truth, how many times do you find the two together? And it's often. Mercy and truth have been met together. Do you know who you are? We are called his remnant church. We are called in the New Testament and in his remnant church. We are called the priesthood of all believers. Yes? This is not news to you, right? Do you believe that? You're allowed to say hallelujah. You're allowed to say amen. Do you know who you are? What about this verse? All the kings of the earth praising you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. When's that going to happen? You know who the kings of the earth are and have been? Pharaoh was king of Egypt. Did he ever praise God, hearing the words of God's mouth? Do the kings and leaders of the world nations today praise God like this? The Bible says, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Sing! The kings of this earth? <coughs> when will this be fulfilled? Well, yes, the answer is, on the day of judgment, the Bible says that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus himself told the high priest, you will see me no more. Till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus instructed those who hated him. One day, you're going to praise God. Ella White writes that the praise does not come from the mouths because they love God. 
The praise comes from the mouth at that moment in time. It's yet in the future. They will not, they cannot resist the fourth force of truth. And that's why they praise. Even Satan himself will praise. So is that the only time this scripture is going to be fulfilled? At the judgment time? Because King David wrote this. And I believe King David had another kind of hope. That one too, yes. But there's more. There's time on earth right now when I believe this scripture should be fulfilled. So when else might it be fulfilled? When will all the kings of the earth praise God like this? The answer? When we are in the new earth, where only righteousness dwells, why? <clears throat> because we are called kings and priests to our God. Isn't that in the Revelation? Amen. Two or three times. We are called kings and priests to our God. And if ladies prefer, prefer it, queens, because God doesn't mind. Prince and princesses, the boys and girls prefer that. We are called a kingdom of priests. We are called kings and priests to our God. And we live on this earth right now, by the way. So not only in heaven will we all, all we kings, be praising God, but on this earth right now we can do this, can't we? Amen. This can happen right now. We can praise God like that right now. Do you know who you are? If you are walking with Jesus, keeping his commandments, and walking in the faith of Jesus, then you are a king. What about those in verse 6, who feel downcast. <clears throat> Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. What does that mean? I don't have to talk too much about this. I could preach a thousand times on this and it might always be different. There's always more to get. You feeling lowly? You feeling low? The Lord says he regards you. You know he lifts you up. I don't want to talk so much about that one right now. I want to talk about the second part of the verse more. The proud he knows from afar. You know some people like this, and you may have been this way yourself once. You ever been proud? Don't we have that danger all the time anyway? <clears throat> Human beings, that's our nature, isn't it? To be a little prideful. Well, the scripture says the Lord knows the proud from afar. What does that mean? I believe it means the Lord still wants to help them, still wants to help you. I believe it means the Lord loves you. I believe it means he sent his only son, Jesus, to this earth to die for you, to save you. This is the great proof of his love. The great proof that God loves the world and therefore loves you is that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I love that old English word. It means whoever, but I like whosoever. Because that really tells me it's anybody. Whosoever believes in Jesus, anyone willing to take the risk, and I say it this way especially for the young people, because it's a risk to say you believe in Jesus today, especially in school. You remember back what happened in 1999 in Columbine, Colorado, when young people were told, are you a Christian? Because you tell me yes, I'm going to shoot you, and they had to make a decision. And some young people died and got shot instead of denying Christ. 1999, and they weren't even Seventh-day Adventists, they were just Christians. But it really is no risk at all when you believe in Jesus because you have your hope secure. You've got to know this hope or it's not secure. You've got to know the hope. You understand? The reason people are insecure in their religion or in their faith is because they don't really know the hope. They're not sure about it. Does God really love me? I have news for you today. Psalm 138 is asking you, do you know who you are? Yes, he does. Really love you. Smoke? Drink? Tattoo? Bad past? Going through bad stuff right now? People think you're Christian, but on the inside you're feeling something different? God knows. And even if you're proud, the Bible says he knows you from afar. <clears throat> now, you could say that that means that God doesn't know them at all, but I don't believe that's what it means. You see, Jesus 
prevailed over sin. God has not left us alone. He has fought to win us back. And Jesus is the proof of that. The greatest battle ever fought is the battle of the mind. The battle of the heart. Jesus fought that fight on the cross. And it looked like the cross prevailed. It looked like the cross won. Because Jesus died. But he rose again. He prevailed over the cross. He prevailed over sin. That's why he told all his people, take up your cross and follow me. Because we have to prevail over our own crosses. We can't ignore them or we will never prevail. Jesus prevailed so that he is able to save, as it says in the book of Hebrews, to the uttermost those who come unto God through him. <coughs> all who come to him with all their sins and ask for his help, for his healing hand to be upon them as they walk in this life now. Yes, we live in sinful human flesh. Our clothes can't cover it up. It's who we are. <clears throat> With all the struggles that are upon us, all that is upon you, Jesus has prevailed against sin so that he can help you prevail against your personal struggles with sin. Do you believe he is able to do that? Quiet down. Quiet bunch here. That's why it says the proud he knows from afar. For those who are proud are too proud to believe that God really loves them, too proud to believe that God cares for them. They're more like deists. The way I describe the deist, the watchmaker God. Unless you're coming to Jesus humbly and willing to confess all your sins, unless you come to him like that, he can't help you much. He can help you from afar. Do you understand? Because your parents and your grandparents and you as parents yourself pray for your children, some who are not walking with Christ. Isn't that so? And I heard it in the Sabbath school prayer today and in the church prayer today. I want them to be saved. I heard that. We hear it again and again at church, don't we? We're praying for those we love to come to Christ. I have people in my family I'm praying to come and make the final decisions and to walk with Christ like me. As Paul said, I desire all men to be as I am except for these chains. Yes, I want him to know what I know and to believe what I believe because I feel secure in my belief. Jesus has made me that way. And I'm praying for them to know this. Can I get a witness out there, y'all? Anybody have this in their life, or are your families all perfect and they're already on the road? Maybe they're all missionaries out there witnessing right now. Unless you come to Jesus humbly, willing to confess all your sins. And by the way, it's only to Him. You don't have to tell the world your sins. It's really none of their business. You don't have to tell the church your sins. It's really none of our business. Unless you personally sinned against somebody, you need to confess that. That's a different thing. I don't like hearing testimonies when someone goes and recounts all their sins. I really hear them say, Jesus delivered me. It's glory to God to tell how God delivered you, not what you were going through before he delivered you. Amen. And we as human beings get off into those stories too much, don't we? So confess your sins to Jesus and be free and know that you don't have to tell anybody else. Amen. Unless you need some personal help from a pastor, from a parent, from a counselor, from a trusted friend. But if you stay proud, the Lord cannot help you too much. But he helps you a little bit because someone's praying for you. And you have to believe that for those you're praying for, God knows them from afar. And because you're praying for that, he can get a little bit closer to them than he could otherwise. The Lord will never force your will. It's all about your choice. But you can humble yourself and give him your will. And if you do that, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He will work in you to effect great and good change, and you will develop in character, and you will find true peace. Peace, not the world's kind of peace, real peace and real freedom. Whether you're slave or free, in this world's eyes, you'll have freedom in God's eyes and in your own. No longer will you be in bondage to sin. Ellen White wrote it like this in my, one of my favorite devotional books, Steps of Christ. 
Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like, you know the words, ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts. That's me, Lord. Your impulses. That's me, Lord. Your affections. That's me, Lord. That's why Paul said, I die daily. And I have to die daily. Or those impulses, affections, and thoughts overcome me. Is it that way with you? Because yes. tomorrow's a new day. And guess what? Tomorrow you're not in heaven yet. And Satan is still here, and the temptations are still here. And everything that tempts you may be different than everything that tempts me, but they're still there. And just because you got baptized and became a Christian doesn't mean the temptations go away. Jesus did not remove us from temptation. He saves us from it. We have our part, our part to do. But what we need to understand, Sister White writes, is the true force of the will. The trouble is we have this guilt. She writes this about that guilt. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence. That's guilt. And we don't feel like we're worthy to go back to him and start to forget who we are. Yes, I'm a sinner. Admit it. I blew it again. Come back to him because he loves us and he'll always take us. Merciful and gracious. Long-suffering. Abundant in goodness and truth. This God of ours. The will is the governing power in the nature of man. The what? The what? The will. That's about choice. Your freedom of choice. We believe in free choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. How much depends on the right action of your will? It says everything. Everything. I used to tell the men in prison, it this way. I know you've got temptations. I knew murderers. I knew rapists. I knew child molesters. I knew some had come to Christ. I knew some were just thieves that had come to Christ. You know, very few of them I really saw as born again because it just kept going back. But there were a couple that really came out because they gave their will to Jesus. Not my will, but his. How do you do that? So test them out. God, I'm having trouble with sin X or sin Y or sin Z. How am I to overcome that? Well, you start by doing it. But that hurts God. I don't want to do it because I like sin X. I like sin Y. I like sin Z. Isn't that the problem? I compare it easily to smoking. It's hard to break that habit, isn't it? It's hard to break that habit. I want to quit, but I can't stop. And I might not even like it, but now I'm addicted to it. I can't stop. But if I force myself to put my will on God's side and stop, what she writes next is so beautiful. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ and your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Your mind, your thoughts will change. I know because I used to smoke when I was a rebellious teen. You know, I hate cigarette smoking now. But there was a time for years afterwards, after I quit, and I quit because I was getting in trouble. There was a time for years afterwards, especially when you're young, the magazine ads and things that they had, TV commercials at that time, they attract young people, and I was attracted to them, and I could not help it. I was attracted to them, and I could not help it. But now I can help it. Now I hate them. But there was a time I was attracted to them. So what happened? My mind, my thinking changed because I gave God my will. Do you understand? It's that way with every besetting <coughs> sin that any of us could go through. We have to force ourselves to stop, even though we can't stop, but we force ourselves to stop, and we pray to God, and He changes our heart. Amen. That's how it works. That's how we overcome and some people, I, I heard a man tell me once, he uh, was a marijuana smoker, a cigarette smoker and all that. And he said one day he was in the shower and he just prayed and God took it from him and he never had a temptation again. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? God, you took the sin from me and I never had temptation again. Wouldn't that be nice? But guess what? I knew the man. 
God gave him an easy one on that one, smoking. But there were other things that he had struggles with. So that's also true for you and me. Some things God gives it to us easy because we need that, but there are other things that are hard for each one of us. And what may be hard for me might be easy for you. We shouldn't be judging each other because of that. We have to identify and pray to help our people get over these things. Isn't that true? Amen. The proud he knows from afar. Don't be proud on this. Admit your sins to God. Otherwise, he can barely help you. When Thomas Jefferson grew into childhood, John Meekin writes, that's when he first consciously encountered the complexities of life in slave-owning Virginia. I'm looking at that scripture, verse 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. God revives me. Here's what happened to Jefferson. He would write decades later about the experience when he was a child. You know how children are? You, you look at something like I was with my eighth grade teacher. How can this be? How can you write all men are created equal and then enslave some? Such hypocrisy is obvious to us, isn't it? It wasn't obvious to them then. Jefferson wrote this. The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part, and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it, for man is an imitative animal. <laughs> the parent storms, the child looks on, catches the lineaments of wrath, that means it gets in their character. <clears throat> wrath gets in their character. Puts on the same airs in the circle of smaller slaves, gives a loose to his worst passions, and thus nursed, <clears throat> educated, and daily exercised in tyranny cannot but be stamped by it with odious peculiarities. Jefferson recognized a universal truth about human nature. Do we understand the evil work of slavery upon the character of men? Upon women and children. When I say men, I mean all people, all human beings. Do we understand that? <coughs> I posted this on Facebook in honor of Black History Month as this is a good time for all Americans to remember and to think on such things. The creator of the heavens and the earth sees all the good and evil that human beings do to each other and through Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection, he has provided an answer to all the evil caused by sin. Those who believe in him are saved <laughs> because they believe in Jesus. They are called to a higher standard of character. They must develop a higher character. We must continue to develop a higher character, Amen. even the character of Jesus. This is why the Bible says of that remnant church, here are those that keep the commandments of God, but don't stop there. And the faith of Jesus The faith he lived by when he walked as a man on this earth. See, Black History Month is also a time to remember how God has used his people, whether slaves or free, to bear witness to the world about these things. <coughs> <coughs> what about those sinful tendencies and thoughts that cannot seem to escape, though? The issue today is not slavery anymore. Prejudice and racism is still with us, yeah, but there's another issue, and it's the sexual agenda, isn't it? I believe these words will give hope to the promiscuous, whoever they may be, whether homosexual, gay, or heterosexual, straight. And one sin is not worse than the other. If you're promiscuous, you're promiscuous, and you're not going to heaven being promiscuous. You've got to get the victory over that. I believe these words will give help and hope to anyone who feels trapped in sin and thinks that God cannot help them or love them Yes, these words give hope. You will revive them. You will revive me, though I walk in the midst of trouble. He will revive you, though you walk in the midst of trouble. He will revive them. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. 
Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. Step to Christ, page 47. See, they don't come to the point of yielding their will to God. They understand they need to be saved. They want to be saved, but they hold on to their will. That's the hard thing. To let go of your will. To do something you don't want to do. By yielding your will up to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God. Not only do we have to die daily, but sometimes we have to die moment by moment, don't we? You might have a great devotional in the morning and be close to God in the morning. And by noon, something comes your way that tempts you. Or in the evening, maybe a show comes on TV or something that tempts you. And you're thinking a whole different set of thoughts. It's kind of like we're two different people, isn't it? What about when you're persecuted by others? That same scripture says, You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. I imagine it's like a football fullback or running back running with a football in his right arm. And what's he doing with his left arm, his other arm? He's straight arming the tacklers and knocking them all down. That fullback is God, and you're the football. I'm the football. God is saving us with his right hand, and with his other hand, he's stretching it out against the wrath of his enemies, and they can't tackle him. Amen. You're secure. God's doing the running. We're being carried by Him if we give Him our will. See, I, I'm praying for the churches and the members, and I'm thinking of different people in the churches. I know down in Thomaston, Chris Caron has a heart to want to do evangelism there in Thomaston, and he needs a better job, and he needs a lot of things to do that. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things in the way, but he wants to do that. I know that there are those who are sick. Our own Sandra Brown, you know, how long she's been suffering in the hospital and going through that perseverance. My goodness, I'm thinking of that in the prayer. I'm thinking of John Dale down in Thomaston who has kidney disease and gout now. And, and I just think of so many others, that, and you know, and some of you have witnessed to that effect even today. And we get old. And the older we get, the closer we are to the illnesses and the things that finally put us into the grave. I want to be alive when Jesus comes. But I want to be there more importantly than anything. And I think Jesus can take a 90 year or, or a 100 year old through the time of trouble. I do believe that. We won't, we won't all be 20 year olds going through the time of trouble. It might happen tomorrow. It's going to happen real fast. Things are changing. I think of Chuck Pillsbury with the, the heart problems he's had. Visited with him and Judy last night. What a great visit. He's feeling better. Hope to have seen him today, but that's okay. He's feeling better, at least a little bit. I'm also praying for younger people. And you know who you are. That they may grow in number, but also in strength and spirit of God. And our church was started by young people. Ages, you know, Uriah Smith, Ellen White, James White. I think James was 24. Ellen White was 19. Uriah Smith, 17, 18. His sister, Annie Smith, who wrote a couple of our hymns, died when she was 27 and already worked for 10 years in the faith. These were young, vibrant people. 12-year-olds can think like this. 12-year-olds can be great workers for the Lord. We don't have to wait till we're 60. The only reason 60-year-olds and plus are running the church because it seems like no one else will do it. But we got to pray for young people and pray for them to walk with Christ. And young people, pray for yourselves to walk with Christ because it's a risk in your day and age. It's harder for you in school than it's been for any of us and if you grow up to have children before Jesus comes, it will be harder for them, I guarantee you. It's not getting easier, it's harder. And it's not just the peer pressure, it's what they're teaching. But God says, we are the work of his hands. God says he will perfect that which concerns us. His mercy endures forever to perfect me. Do you understand? To perfect you. That's why that last verse, verse 8, the Lord will perfect that will which concerns me, David cries out. The very next thing he says is your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. He recognizes that he is the work of God's hands. Amen. Do you know who you are? You are a king. We are the kings of the earth. We are to be kings and priests to our God. So you are a king. You are the work of his hands. 
if you have some time today, read Deuteronomy 17, when God called them to account. He says, when you get ready to call for a king in the land, because you get tired of having the prophet over you, Deuteronomy 17, he gave some instructions about what that king should do and be like. And he said, among all things, in verse 18 of Deuteronomy chapter 17, also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. The one that's before the priest, the same one the priests have, the king shall write for himself, write for himself a copy of this law. And it shall be with him and you shall read it all the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God. And be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. And that his heart may not be lifted up. That he may not become proud. Because if he becomes proud, I can only help him from afar. <clears throat> the New Testament shows our true destiny. The book of Revelation shows that we are kings and priests to our God. So you are a king. You are a priest. God says, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. God knew you. You were born into this earth, yes, that's not your fault. You were born into sin, yes, that's not your fault. But you have been predestined to be reborn by God. Every single human being has been predestined to be reborn because of Jesus' death on the cross. That's what he came to do. To complete the predestination of all human beings, but it's still a choice. Born again, to be formed in the image of God, and all humans have this opportunity, that means we can keep praying for those we love. We restore it back into the image of God. This was our original destiny. Now, we know many humans have taken a detour from God's plans, but he knows the plans he has for you, <coughs> plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And this hope is only found in Jesus Christ. That's why he came to earth and that's why he left his word to give us this hope. Do you know who you are? Then say it with me. I am a king. Say it again. I am a king. I am a priest. Kings and priests are God. We're still a work in progress. Let me close with this. I remember a children's song. My daughters were in the Seventh-day Adventist school there in L.A. where we live. I don't remember it was first, second, or third grade. But they were there in front of the church singing this song. I still remember these words to this day. You know the song? Kids under construction, maybe the paint is still wet. Kids under construction, the Lord isn't finished with me yet. We're a work in progress. But never forget who you are. Amen. Amen.